Hello and welcome to episode 119 of the How to Survive podcast. My name is Chris and joining me in this stinking cell of a room is Joe. You what, mate? Do you fight about it? A lot That's of, right. Lot of we're, doing, lot we're, doing, of <laughs> we're doing Bronson. <laughs> this week's film is Brawl in Cell Block 99, the S. Craig Zala smash hit, Yeah, uh, which is in some cinemas now but it's also available on amazon video to stream yeah um which is how we saw it and uh yeah it's a, a listener request yeah Stuart baxter was in touch on on the email mm. at how to survive show at gmail.com mm-hmm. and he said we should check it out yeah um, th- there's more on Stuart baxter later because he got back in touch after sending that that's so some, stay tuned to that's, hear more from Stu. That's some top listener correspondence. And yeah. uh, S. Craig Zahler, obviously, obviously, it was the director of a film that we covered quite some time ago, yeah. which was Bone Tomahawk. Yeah. A film in which uh, halfway through, there was a, a series of uh, plot events mm. that necessitated a uh, trip into what you might see as B-movie gore um, and shocks. Yeah. Uh, nothing like this film, you understand. <laughs> um, but if you don't want the secrets and surprises of uh, Brawl in Cell Block 99 mm. to be ruined for you, then now is your chance to duck out, go on Amazon Video or equivalent uh, streaming service mm-hmm. and watch the film and uh, then meet us back here. Um, yeah, meet us around the back of Cell Block 99. Yeah, well, I'll, where I'll be stamping on Joe's head repeatedly. Spoilers. So a recap for Brawl in Cell Block 99, Joe, mm. uh, before we talk about how we would survive. Now, every once in a while, I see a man in that chair who could just as easily be on this side of the table. That muscle just for show. Sure. Helps me lift stuff. Man principle. Relinquish it now. You know the difference between right or wrong. And you have a moral compass. I knew before you told me that you got an American flag in your home, you probably got more than one. You're a patriot. Vince Vaughn plays Bradley Thomas, a former alcoholic and drug dealer who is fired from his tow truck job. The same day, he returns home to find out his wife, Lauren, has cheated on him. After angrily destroying her car with his bare hands, they reconcile and agree to rebuild their marriage, but Bradley decides to return to drug dealing. He says it's only a temporary thing, so he can build a life, basically. Yeah, only temporary. 18 months later, Lauren is pregnant and Bradley is still working for Gil, a drug baron. Bradley is tasked with receiving a stash of drugs with two Mexican criminals who represent a Mexican crime syndicate run by a man named Eliezer. Bradley doesn't trust the two men, and the pickup goes awry when the police arrive, starting a gunfight with the Mexicans. Bradley, who has not been seen by the police, has an opportunity to escape, but instead decides to save the police officers, killing one of the two Mexicans and knocking the other unconscious. Bradley is arrested and sent to a medium security prison. With me so far? Yeah, but basically he was given a light sentence because he saved the police officers' lives, but they couldn't uh, get around the fact that he was selling drugs. Yeah, so he got seven years rather yeah. than four or five like he was hoping. Mm-hmm. On his second day of prison, Bradley is visited by an employee of Eliezer, known as the Placid Man, and is informed that Eliezer has kidnapped Lauren. The man instructs Bradley to find a man called Christopher Bridge, who is in cell block 99 of nearby maximum security prison Redleaf, or they will dismember Bradley's unborn daughter while she is still inside Lauren. Mm. To get himself transferred, Bradley brutally attacks several police officers and is quickly moved to Redleaf as a dangerous criminal. Yeah, you know, really police officers, more um, prison guards. Prison guards, sorry, yeah. yeah. At Redleaf, the tyrannical Warden Tugs humiliates Bradley and leaves him in a cell covered in feces. Not yet in cell block 99, Bradley uses some yard time to assault some fellow prisoners and eventually some guards, necessitating his transfer to cell block 99, which is reserved for paedophiles and psychotics. In cell block 99, Bradley is fitted with a belt which delivers an electrical charge any time he misbehaves. 
Soon afterwards, Bradley is dragged through to a separate room where he finds Eleazar and three of his friends, mm. one of whom is the man Bradley knocked unconscious during the earlier gunfight. Yeah, there was no Christopher Bridge after all. It was all a big setup. It's revealed that Christopher Bridges does not exist, and as Bradley's intervention resulted in Eleazar also being convicted, Bradley has been duped into coming to cell block 99 in order to be tortured at Eleazar's leisure for the duration of his sentence. Eleazar's men beat Bradley unconscious. Back in his cell, Bradley uses the rubber lining of his shoes to insulate himself from the electric shocks from his belt. When the guards arrive to take him back to Eleazar, Bradley overpowers them, inadvertently killing the more sadistic one of the pair. Bradley goes to Eleazar and brutally dispatches each of his henchmen before breaking Eleazar's leg. In exchange for his life, Eleazar makes the placid man deliver Lauren safely to Gil, which he does. Gil then retrieves a hidden assault rifle and guns down the placid man before Lauren does the same to her would-be abortionist. Lauren, who is unharmed, says her goodbyes to Bradley, who also shares a few words with their unborn child. Knowing Lauren is safe, Bradley grabs Eleazar and places his head over a makeshift toilet in his cell and stamps on his head repeatedly, decapitating him. Warden Tugs enters the cell and Bradley, who has now accepted his fate, is shot dead. And that is S. Craig Zahler's <laughs> brawl in Cell Block 99. Brawl might be uh, stretching it a bit mm. or implying certain events that don't end up transpiring. Mm. Uh, but it is, I would say, an interesting film. What, laugh a minute stuff. <laughs> what did you think of S. Craig Zahler's brawl in Cell Block 99, as I will insist on it being called yeah, <laughs> in full? full. Yeah. yeah, I quite liked it. Yeah? Yeah, it was good fun. Um, and genuinely very tense, yeah? I think. Yeah. Uh, often when I'm watching a movie, I, I become aware of myself. Okay. You know, you think, oh, suddenly I'm leaning forward at the edge of my seat and grinning. Yeah. And it's good when that happens in a movie. Mm. Interestingly, it happened in uh, Paranormal Activity 3, which we're doing next week. Great. So just tune in to find out why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it happened basically all the way through the third act in this. I was like, it was very tense. But mm. that's exciting. It was it was a good film. Vince Vaughn, very good. Yeah. Uh, obviously. Yes. Do, yeah. you, do you agree? I do agree. He's. Um, it's a very physical performance, yes. not only in like the fact that he's in a lot of fights, but just like every second that he's in the frame, it's like he's this sort of broiling mass yeah. of like yeah. controlled uh, aggression. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And he's like, he's al it's almost unrecognizably Vince Vaughn. Mm. Like he's frightening in a way that you really don't uh, associate with Vince Vaughn. Yeah, I think maybe it's unfair as well because I, I'm assuming you're the same as me that you only associate him with comedy roles yeah like you know sort of uh knock about wacky yeah. sort of uh rom-com like, was he in stuff. wedding crashes yeah, yeah yeah stuff like that yeah uh but uh, the guy who made in Stuart Baxter said it, like um Vince Vaughn was really good in True Detective season two mm. but what it reminded me of was True Detective season one in okay. like the Matthew McConaughey like transformation right up until then he'd been like rom-com man and then was suddenly taken seriously by everyone because he did this like incredible Transformation, exactly, yeah, yeah, and it, and I guess you could compare it as well to um, Brian Cranston in Breaking Bad, going yeah. from sitcom dad to uh, what would you call it, drug drug kingpin, but yeah, it's certainly going to a very serious and believable role, mm. and yeah, his his performance was pretty much the best part of this film, yeah, and he, um, it it seems like he because his character is an ex boxer, yeah, and it seems like the way he carries himself throughout is very sort of. Um, true to that yeah and the way he dismantles that car yeah at the beginning yeah it's like start, yeah, yeah it starts off like almost comical mm. for like the i don't know i don't know why but the way he sort of like um breaks he starts hitting the like um passenger side window yeah with like the side of his fist and it seems a little bit sort of like you know like you'd bang your fist on a table right and then he like smashes his other fist like straight through it and then just sets about like dismantling the car. Punches the of, bonnet until yeah, it pops off. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like um, what that could have been a scene which was silly and over the top and comical. Mm. But it for some reason is like a sort of very um, 
effective demonstration of the character's power. Mm. Um, yeah, and obviously... But also the fact it's, it's weirdly controlled as well. Like, he knows what he's doing the whole time. Yeah. It's not like... It, if you had a character punch a hole through a wall in a movie, typically, it would be that they're, you know, a wife-beating maniac. Right. But he's just like... He does it so precisely, and then he goes and has like a calm conversation. Right, and and that I thought was a very sort of um, like non stereotypical portrayal of this sort of character as well in that mm. situation. Yeah, because I don't know about you, but when he was dis- when he was like smashing the car to pieces, I was thinking, ah, oh, this is this going to go in the direction of him like beating up his wife? Yeah, and. I was very glad that it it shirked away from that. Yeah. Like, and it, it, um, you know, instead, like you say, he goes inside, he has a very calm and reasoned discussion with his wife yeah. and like, doesn't even like shout at her yeah. or say, you know, you bitch, I can't believe you've done this. It's more like, I understand like yeah. how you've gotten yeah, to this yeah. point. We've just and, apart a bit. Let's, let's, re, let's rebuild it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's a sort of a strange lack of affect from Vince Vaughn's character almost all the way through the film in mm. the in the sense that like even when he's like stamping people's heads to pieces mm. he's sort of like quite Doing dutifully yeah like <laughs> yeah. calm and reserved yeah. and like yeah it's very it's a it's a very strange restrained performance mm. for this kind of film but i think it really works yeah the only emotion he does show is in that final scene when he's crying when he's talking to the unborn baby yeah which is over the phone, uh, yeah. Not not in like some sort of weird dream sequence, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's the only time he expresses anything other than just like cool complacency. He's like Clint Eastwood in like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly or something, just like no emotion, yeah. And until the end. But like what I found was with Bone Tomahawk, right? Mm. There was a deep message in that which we dissected. Go back and listen to that episode if you want more on it. And if, mm. you, if you haven't seen it, we won't spoil it. But there is a message in that of something like don't don't buy into toxic masculinity. Right. And that typically in that movie, the, the masculine figures are uh, humiliated in some way. Right. At the end of it. It's exposing the myth of the cowboy. Yeah, exactly. Ways. Yeah. Yeah. Where I don't know what the, the strong message is in this. And I don't, I mean, it must be one because S. Craig Zahler is a talented writer. And yeah. Went, and, but what, what struck me about this was it kind of just seems like a, a like descent into chaos and depression. Yeah. Like it's just one bad decision he makes. Uh, I yeah. mean, obviously he should be a drug dealer, but if you take away that part, yeah, like he he decides to go back and help the police, and from that point on, he's just on like a yeah a, a down runaway spiral. train to being killed. Yeah, I think I think maybe because this film is um, obviously aping those sort of grindhouse action movies of the nineteen seventies, right. that this perhaps doesn't have a deeper meaning because it's um, more trying to recapture that style right you know which was something like death proof or right. you know like vigilante yeah. sort i mean of, you, you could get something like max Payne, uh, right or taken that famous 1970s yeah but you know yeah. it's, it's, no, it's, know, it's, yeah. it's, it's the like a man the... with nothing to lose sort yeah. of thing right? <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah but it's it is like um the punisher yeah like he basically from the moment bradley's wife is put in jeopardy and he can't like immediately s- solve it it's just like he's very calmly just gone, right, well, I know what I have to do now. I know <laughs> I know each like step yeah. to achieving the goal of my wife being safe. So now I'll just calmly and incredibly violently go about it. Yeah. And yeah. And like we often pair films, as, mm-hmm. as we say sometimes, um, just because you know there is, it's sort of an interesting point of discussion, and this is broadly a crime film, yeah. Uh, as was The Untouchables last week, right? Yeah. But you will not find two more polar opposite films <laughs> yeah. than The Untouchables and Broad and Cellbrook Ninety Nine, yeah. despite the fact that they're dr- dealing with like um, crime and punishment, and like crime relating to the prohibition of a uh, banned substance. Yeah, yeah. They are so, and even even to an extent, um, having to become violent in order to right find your like means to an end kind of thing. Yeah, because he doesn't exactly. want to be violent. He's, he says at one point, "I don't like punching people for no reason." Yeah, but then and he's I given a reason, and he he loves it. Yeah, that's partly why he re- he goes back to help the police officers as mm. well. I think is because he doesn't want people to get hurt, and 
I think it's quite pointed that as he's walking away in the background, you can hear like a police officer shouting for help. Right. Or or a police officer who's been shot. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the message. Maybe that is the message that, um, you know, this man tried everything to not be violent, to yeah. not deal with things in a violent manner. Yeah. Like he doesn't even want to get involved with boxing because he says that... <laughs> it's unnecessary violence. Yeah, he, yeah. Do, he, doesn't, he doesn't see the point in punching another man for no reason. Yeah. But the second he has a reason, <laughs> yeah. it's just like the most explosive, unrelenting violence. Yeah. And it's like that for the last half of the film. Yeah, I mean, Bone Tomahawk again had those moments of like upsetting violence yeah where it, was like, it sticks with you afterwards for quite a long time mm. this one less so but what i was struck by was uh, i uh, i was on facebook before i saw the film okay and someone else had gone to see it and this is just like not a, not a friend but you know a, a facebook friend right. someone i knew years and years ago and they said something like oh it's got the the best head smashing scene since american history x right and so if that's your criteria for what makes a good film yeah yeah you've come to the right place but also oh very dear. different <laughs> contextually i think yeah. as well yeah yeah um it's as we said it's sort of a grindhouse movie modern attempt at a grindhouse movie yeah and the film that it sort of reminded me of that we've covered relatively recently was from dusk till dawn because that's a film that again tries to recapture that sort of grimy seventies mm-hmm. um, B movie aesthetic. Yeah. But the difference is that this doesn't have the sort of leering sexism and lack of depth that you get with from dusk till dawn, where everything's just a pastiche. Everything's just about surface and yeah, yeah. how it looks and, and how funny, is it? how naughty or can we be? Yeah. Right. And, and I, I do um, think that perhaps the looming threat of sort of fetal dismemberment is quite unpalatable. Although, you know, obviously unpalatable, you know, deliberately deliberately unpalatable. Despite that, I think uh, Lauren is a relatively powerful female character. Yeah. But then again, you know, because she takes her own revenge at the end. Mm. um, But then she does really only exist to be a thing to hurt Bradley. Like, the MacGuffin, right? I suppose, yeah, yeah. Um, and she's almost the only female character in the whole film. Do you think she is the only one? There's also the counselor that he meets, like right. for f- two minutes in right. the prison. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that uh, the depth in the film comes from. So, there's, I mean, that that's my like one misgiving. I think is that yeah. there's, there's there's a no, bit of a damsel in a stressful situation, yeah. Yeah. which I. I suppose that both of those elements you could say are lifted from the Grindhouse films of that, yeah, exactly, that era. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I liked the fact that Bradley is like an incredibly violent man, but clearly has, or has the potential to be an incredibly violent man, yeah. but clearly has this moral compass that he sticks to religiously. Um, and in that sense, appears to be quite a complex character. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of backstory to him that is alluded to, but not, fully explored which is a, a positive in our books yeah often um and the the violence and gore which is obviously a, a calling card of those films mm-hmm. grindhouse films um is extreme uh and fantastical yeah um particularly the scraping of a guy's <laughs> face off yeah and that was, uh, that was pretty silly yeah. stamping stamping a man's head off and also stamping a man's jaw into pieces that yeah. like flies out even the final shot of um the final Dennis shot is getting this bradley bradley getting shot is bizarre I wish I kept, that, I kept having to go back over yeah. and watch it again because i like, i wish that wasn't in the film yeah. in some ways yeah um because I'd seen this before you, and I said, because uh, you asked, oh, this, is, this is funny actually, you mm. asked if it was sort of partner suitable. Yeah, safe for wife. Yeah. yeah. And um, I said that probably not. Yeah. And equally, you probably didn't want to watch it like on public transport. Yeah. Um, Which I did. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But the violence is so extreme mm. that it almost tips over from the point of being like, upsetting or offensive because it's just so ridiculous yeah there's a scene at the end of the hateful eight with the tarantino movie mm. which i don't mind spoiling because you shouldn't watch it anyway uh 
where basically all the characters are just being shot to bits and various people in the room are being hanged but right. are also not dying. They're just like also being shot to bits and it's just an absolute bloodbath. Yeah. And it's that very Tarantino way of being like, this is over the top violence. And it's like the difference between them, right, is Tarantino is so superficial. Yeah. And as much as he'll, you know, go on oh, making a point about Westerns, it's like, well, you're not, are you? You're mm. not really. No. Yeah. I, this is different from a Tarantino film. And I think you, you compared it earlier to like Grindhouse and stuff. It, it does do that like shocking, so shocking violence and uh, the appearance of having a moral message. But it doesn't have the grating dialogue or racist and sexist undertones yeah. and, and cameos by the director mm. uh, that you get in a Tarantino movie. No. Um, it's a I, bit more serious and substance, substantive. Yeah. Substan substantial. Substantive. Substantial. Yeah. yeah. Um, Subst uh. <laughs> one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the violence in this is uh, obviously he, at the start of the film, the opening scenes, um, he clearly has some sort of like mechanic background. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the way he takes apart that car yeah. suggests that he knows like the intricacies of a car and right. how to dismantle it. Yeah. And that's almost how the violence continues. It's just against people. <laughs> it's like he knows yeah. how to dismantle people. Yeah, effectively. Like he knows how to punch someone in the back in order to bring them to the ground. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, like there's a bit where he elbows someone just a couple of times in like the back of the neck yeah. and kills them that way. And it's sort of horrifying and nasty yeah. and violent obviously but it's done in such a sort of like quick and efficient way yeah that separates it from that sort of tarantino everyone's been shot 500 times yeah yeah you know yeah it is it because th there are i think a lot of people um have sort of earmarked s craig zala as the next tarantino yeah. that's what he's often been billed as and i can sort of see why they're doing that because he's taking sort of genre pieces and adding a really interesting like strange spin on them mm. um and bone tomahawk was the same in the sense that it was a western that took a turn halfway through yeah this is like a crime prison drama that takes a turn halfway through um and in some ways in both of those instances i wouldn't have minded seeing the rest of that first half, you know, like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the second half that doesn't exist to the first half of those films. Right. Yeah. Um, but I like that there's a director who is just going off the wall in, in that way mm. with these sorts of films. I think that's a really interesting thing. Uh, just to bring, bring it back to the, uh, the partners thing. Um, my girlfriend started uh, looking up the IMDB parents guide. No, I've been doing the same right. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like a, a good way of yeah, uh, yes. working the content of yeah. the film. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want spoilers. So I was like, listen, I've got to watch this film. You're probably not going to yeah. enjoy it. People who have listened to the podcast with dedication will, will remember there was an episode that had my girlfriend on it. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't like violence. And <laughs> she's yeah. like, well, it's this film. And I said, it's called Brawl in Cell Block 99. She's like, oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so she looked up the thing. And she was reading it and go and like grimacing yeah. reading it. Yeah, yeah. But she basically she sat in the same room and then at about the sort of two thirds mark, uh, I put headphones in and she like read a book. <laughs> <laughs> and then at a certain point, she said that I was like guffawing because yeah. of the violence, and I was like, oh yeah. And she was like, was it the man getting his head stamped in? And I was like, <laughs> Which one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, but that's what it. That's apparently what it said on IMDb. Yes, yeah, it, uh, it was. It was something like I read it as well for the exact same reason. Right, because they're often spoiler free, aren't they? Yeah, they're sort of yeah. just it's, a man has this thing happen. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the Mark Hermo does a thing where he sometimes reads out the BBFC's classification for movies. Right, and it often acts as a kind of um, like a, holding up a mirror to the film. So it would be something like, like young, older, like young, younger viewers may be upset by the tooth kicking scene. Yeah. And like, right. Okay. That says everything you need to know about the film. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Or, or like the BBFC, it's often like the violence itself isn't problematic, but the tone the film sets 
means the violence takes place in a realistic environment, <laughs> which yeah. some viewers might find upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. But the Tarantino comparisons, to return to that, um, I think another reason that is the comparison stands up is that some of the dialogue strongly reminds me of Tarantino, mm. particularly in the like sort of instances of standoffs between characters. So towards the end, Warden Tug is sort of behind a gate yeah. and Bradley's behind a door. Quick one on that, by the way. Uh, yeah. How did he get out of that situation? Because he was pinned down kind of, if he, if he revealed himself, he'd get shot. Yeah. And then he's back in the cell. Yeah, I think that's like the only yeah. part of the film where I was like, hmm. I, d- I don't know. Maybe that I, I sort of assume they just don't, they weren't just going to shoot him, you know. Because he said he wanted one minute or something. Yeah. So yeah, I honoring think, I think, there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you, if S. Craig Zolp, if you're listening, at How to Survive Pod to explain <laughs> that one away. Uh, but in, in that sort of discussion when they're having a standoff, the warden says, how oh, do I have time to smoke a cigar? Yeah. And he said, oh, I'm not sure. He goes, well, I've got a cigarillo here yeah. that, uh, you know, it's quite a quick smoker. <laughs> and that's like a very sort of that like off kilter dialogue or dialogue that doesn't quite match the context of the scene. Yeah. Is a very Tarantino trait. Yeah. I mean, the only difference is no one was saying fuck or the N word. Yeah. Although the other, the other um, scene that reminded me of Tarantino was mm-hmm. when uh, Bradley's meeting his boss yeah. Gil mm-hmm. They're talking about an associate of theirs who's black yeah. and he uses the N-word. Yeah. And then there's a discussion as to like the, what the, letter yeah, can the, end. The spelling. Yeah. yeah, the spelling of the N-word and whether one is better than the other, like yeah. a, an, a, an affectionate version of it. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah, that again is a quite a Tarantino thing, like a sort of strange out of context with the situation conversation. But perhaps it's more of like a, that could also be seen as a criticism of Tarantino because Bradley's reply Bradley's Mm. reply is, I don't think you can ever use that word politely. Right. Right. Yeah. And Tarantino made uh, Django Unchained and said, oh, it's a a great study on slavery. So the the same year 12 Years a Slave came out. Yeah. He said, yeah, I think his uh, exact phrasing, uh, or maybe not his exact phrasing, but his exact message was, uh, I'm responsible for finally bringing um, discussion of slavery back into, uh, you know, popular culture. And uh, I think I've done a really great great thing with that uh this is a film (laughs) where he appears as a australian Australian man who blows himself up with dynamite (laughs) yeah this is the same year that steve mcqueen's slave Slave is a slave which is i mean probably one of the best films that i hope to never see again yeah i mean it's it's, shinder's list is described as spending three hours in a Concentration camp. Yeah. This is spending three hours in a slave plantation. Yeah. It is it's absolutely brutal. Harrowing. Yeah. yeah. That is a that is a righteous movie and a, the correct way to discuss the matter. Right. Yeah. Which really makes me you excited mean for... Jamie Foxx teaming up with uh, Christoph Waltz as like avenging angels. Yeah. Uh, you mean that's not... The, well, no, the, you, Christoph Waltz, the dentist. Yeah. Who drives around in a giant tooth mobile. Yeah. So it's that time of the show we come to every week. It is, of course, How to Survive. The film is Brawl in Cell Block 99. The man is Joe Sherbel. How would he survive? Let's find out. So my first tip is for Bradley himself. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's just to use one shred of common sense, right? Now, you've seen The Godfather? No, of course you haven't. You haven't seen The Godfather famously, but you've seen crime films before. Yeah. Uh, and you've seen films where there's, there's a vendetta. Right. Like this one. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, what happens typically? Uh, with which part so, of the Okay, film? so um, you and me are criminals. Yeah. And oh, I, I think kill you. Can I... What happens next? Uh, what? Like my boss yeah. comes after you. Yeah. Right. Right. Now... I I know that happens, and I've never been in a criminal gang before. Sure. Um. So how does Bradley not understand that and expect it? So okay. So your point is he should have known that people would come after Lauren. Yeah. Uh. So what's the survival? Tell Lauren that just get out of Dodge. Get out of town. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Sell the house remotely, and I'll look you up when I get out of jail. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, this ties into like very similar to something that I was going to suggest, which is just um, 
kill Ramon. With the, the he's the big guy, right? The the one that he doesn't kill out of the two yeah, 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 yeah. Mexican guys, right? Yeah. Because he's already killed the other guy. Yeah. And then you know, I presume that Ramon has Ramon is the one who tells um Eliezer yeah. about Bradley's betrayal, which is what ends up leading to Lauren being kidnapped, etc. Mm-hmm. Because how would Eli? But how would Eliezer know yeah. if Ramon was dead? Like That's who? True. Who would be there to tell that? Yeah, story? exactly. Yeah, dead men tell no tales. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that's essentially what he's intending on doing anyway. But you know, he, um, it's broadly the same thing that you're suggesting, which is that, you know, have some understanding of cause and effect. I guess. Yeah. 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 Like understand the criminal mind, which you have. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, just like I can understand. Maybe he didn't want to kill Ramon because if you can incapacitate him, that neutralize the threat, kind of thing. And right. like we said, he's not a man of violence unless he has to. Mm. In which case, just yeah, tell Lauren get out of town, go go on holiday. Yeah, he must have cash. Yeah, that's true. They um, uh, as a side note, would Lauren lose the house? Uh, I think you'd have to be able to prove that it was funded by drug money. I was thinking the same thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure how that works. Often they'll put it in someone else's name. So it, maybe it's in her name, in which case it can't be touched. Right. That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it makes sense. I mean, similarly, he mm. could just walk away. There's that There's that moment. Yeah, but I think I think it would be a bit cheap to say, don't walk away, or like, do, 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 do walk do, away. Do walk away, yeah, because he would get away scot-free. Yeah. But and it's just a c- conceit of the film. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, do you think that he would... Like the the police versus those two Mexican guys. Mm. Do you think the Mexican guys are going to win? Like they're surrounded by cops. Yeah, but I mean, they they maybe they'd kill all the police there, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't live long and healthy lives. No, and also Bradley's probably less likely to. It's it's less likely to come back on him. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah, because he's not actively betraying them. He's just getting out of town. Yeah, exactly. Um. Yeah, but so so your your first theory is your first suggestion is uh, tell Lauren I suppose when they're meeting up in the police station go to ground yeah just yeah. run away yeah um, my suggestion for that was uh, kill Ramon yeah. or just or just leave yeah so I yeah I mean basically it's all revolving around that sort of you know use some common original sense. sin yeah. sort of moment yeah. Um, yeah. What about, what, what's your second idea? Second idea is for Eliezer. Oh yeah. Yeah. And is it do some like neck exercises? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They often say if you've got a strong neck, it's much harder to knock you out in a, like a boxing match. Right. Um, even harder to kick your head off your shoulders. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a clean break as well. Yeah, it is. I like the, um, <laughs> He goes like, oh, they they say that uh, yeah. your head stays alive for yeah. a few minutes after you die. I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, as he like falls into a massive bucket full of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You like that? Fun, yeah. fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Eliezer, anyway, my tips yeah. for him. Just, just hire a hitman in the other jail. Right. Because I know he wants to torture matey. Yeah, he doesn't want to kill him though, does he? But they surely just send a, like, okay, what he wants, it seems to me what Eliezer wants is to have Bradley brought to him so he can physically torture him in the room. Yeah. And then send him back to his cell and that's what he's going to do, right? Yeah. And that's what he's going to do, like, repeatedly. Yeah. Or, and if he, if he fights back, then he'll kill the baby and dismember it or whatever. Right. So why doesn't he just, like, here's, here's my pitch for Eliezer. If I was Eliezer's advisor, I'd say, how about this? Do that anyway. Yeah. And keep him in the medium security prison. Right. And is it not that... He's got um, seven years to deal with that anguish. That's going to be quite torturous for him. Okay. A a couple of questions, though. Mm. Is... um, Oh, wait, hang on. When you say do that anyway, do you mean kill the kid? No, I mean, like I said, the the promise that he's made is that he will... Uh, they'll get this, some Korean doctor to come in yeah. and cut the baby's limbs off while it's still in the womb. Yeah. So it's born without limbs, which is obviously a difficult uh, life for anyone. Yeah. So obviously I don't want to advocate that. No. But Eliezer, do <laughs> yeah. that and you will probably cause Bradley enough mental anguish to prove your point. Right. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I mean, he's trying to have his cake and eat it too, isn't he? Yeah. He's, he's trying to do that and also physically torture him Yeah, um, for a substantial amount of time. So, yeah. I mean, the other factor is you said just let him live in the medium security prison. Mm. But what he's essentially done in the film is trick Bradley into getting a life sentence in like the worst place imaginable. That's true, yeah. So it's, it's it, aside from the fact that he's now to hand for Eliezer to torture, mm. he's just like um, blindly led himself into the worst possible situation you can imagine. Do you think Eliezer knows about how handy uh, Bradley is in a fight? No, I don't think he does know that at all. <laughs> right. Because uh, if he did, he probably would think twice about... It's like um, a Rorschach situation, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not locked in here with you, you're locked in here with me. Yeah. Do you know what? I th- I can think a few things. I, th- I know, obviously, Bradley fully deserved to go to prison. Uh, even for his extended amount of time, you know, of seven years. Right. But I can think of fewer, more frightening things than going to prison. Mm. But Do that you, comes across quite well in the film, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. But yeah. then um, it, it comes across uh, less frightening, I'd say, when you're seeing it through the eyes of six foot four uh, across Vince Vaughan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you or I were to go to prison, for example, for yeah. a similar situation... Yeah, uh, that would be not good. No, I don't. I don't really want to go to prison. No, no. that's why I abide by the law. Yeah, straight down the line. Uh, so is that your tip? Don't go to prison. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> don't do a crime. Yeah. Um. Well, you mentioned Gil earlier. Yeah. Um, friend of the show. Yeah. Uh. Well, you could have said um, get Lauren to go live with Gil. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where she ends up at the end of the film anyway. Um, when he gets visited by the Placid Man. Yeah. Um, it's not his name in the film. That's really his credited name. That's his credited name. Yeah. yeah. But he doesn't, no, no one he doesn't have a name. Come on in, film. Placid Man. Yeah, but he, yeah. he doesn't have a name in the film. He's no. played by Udo Kier, yeah. who's a sort of like, you know, a familiar face, I think, if yeah. you've if you've seen any enough movies. Sort of, yeah. Uh, um, also, I'd like to see, um, seeing Cy Abelman again. Yeah. yeah. Um, Z- Zala favourite. Because he yeah. was in uh, Bone Tomahawk as well. He was a barman. Right, of course. Yeah. 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 Maybe they're friends. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, so you're Bradley, you're in prison. Mm-hmm. Placid man comes to see you, says, I've got your wife. Okay, give her back. Uh, well, now, now you leave. Right. Right. First thing is to just go, just phone Gil yeah. and go, hello, it's me. Uh, remember that Mexican guy? He's kidnapped my wife. Yep. yep. Uh, remember how we're lifelong friends yep. and I've made you a considerable amount of money Yeah. and I've not ratted you out or anything. Um, can you go and rescue her, please, with the uh, extremely powerful automatic weaponry that you have? Do you think Gil's going to go for that? Uh, well, he, it seems that he's happy to help as long as it ha- like the, the, the trade happens at his doorstep. Well... I I guess that the what you're sort of alluding to is that he doesn't want it affecting his business, right? But, or his life. Yeah, but then uh, let's say he goes and rescues Lauren. He kills all of the people that he ends up killing anyway. Mm. And Eleazar's now in prison uh, and has no associates that we know of outside of prison. Mm. So the, the result, the net result is the same other than Eleazar's alive. But the problem is you don't know where... You, I mean... You, You'd be sending, you'd be going to a yeah, goose chase. Right? That's true. Yeah. yeah, you don't know where to go. And imagine this, right? So we've we've dealt with crime bosses in the past, not not on the podcast necessarily, but you know, in, <laughs> in real life, in real life, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, think about Tony Soprano, right? Mm. You've seen the Sopranos. Mm-hmm. Imagine he got a phone call from one of his associates who'd gone to prison for getting caught for a crime, right? And he said, "Look, T, I need your help. Uh, they got my wife." Yeah, he'd go fucking don't call this number again and throw it in the pool. Uh, do you think if it was like Silvio? I mean, I assume there's some way of them getting in touch that isn't just going to be Bradley phoning him up and going, oh, crime boss, Mr. Crime boss, will you please help me with a murder? Like, he's going to have a more sensible way of getting in touch, surely. He doesn't seem to be. He seems to be pretty... But he doesn't get in touch at all in the film, so you have no idea. No, he just goes straight through with the, I'm going to get myself locked up in Max. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, is that how Max works? You get just transferred there in the next day with no trial? Uh, I mean, I think, I think the point is that uh, Redleaf is a privately run enterprise, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's the point, right? That's the difference between where he is initially and... Um, yeah, because he's got like the... Like what I liked about it was you got like it's it's an uncomfortable place and you kind of think oh I'd hate to go to prison but then yeah. he's got like a, a a caseworker who's like oh you know I really want to let's do something good here yeah and the guy like the this this the kindly prison... like Morgan Freeman yeah. role yeah. yeah and you've got the prison warden as well who's like look I'm really sorry I was hard on you this morning what I really yeah. want is for you to join the boxing I think you did really well exactly yeah. and you'd be like oh he, actually he's quite nice yeah and then thirty seconds later Vince Vaughn's snapping his arm like yeah. a twig. Can yeah. you imagine the different movie where that conversation with the kindly man or whatever his name was? Yeah, the lefty. classic man. Oh, happened. right, is he? Yeah, well, that's what I mean, is that I want to see, I almost want to see that film. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the film where Vince Vaughn... Joins the boxing club. Yeah, <laughs> and becomes like a, a boxer. Because I thought maybe that what the film's going to do is he's going to like um, become a boxer, mm. part of the boxing club, and then... There's going to be an inter prison boxing like tournament, and, and him he's going to like batter him in the ring, to, like right. beat him to death, uh, and then he will get away with it because it's like all right. all is fair in sport. Like he just have to hit him so hard with one punch <laughs> that he just kills him instantly. Yeah. Like punches his head clean off his shoulders. Yeah, uh, like a bizarre like Rocky, <laughs> um, like sort of inversion. Yeah, but yeah, I like you know it. It's uh, it's an idea basically. Get get Gil to help out. Yeah, I've no problem with with that necessarily. Mm. I think he'd probably say no, but at least at least ask the questions. Yeah, they seem close though. Yeah, in in the same way that a boss is going to be close to his best owner. Yeah, uh, well, and in in the, in the same way that any pimp would exploit a, a prostitute and be close yeah. to her. He's mm. he like Gil. Don't get don't get confused. Gil is a businessman. Yeah, well, you're a businessman yourself. Mm. Um, yeah, so. If one of your suppliers <laughs> ended up in prison, yeah. No. Let's, so earlier on, I threw threw a head, didn't I? Mm. Stuart's email. Yeah. So Stuart says brawl on cell block ninety nine continued. Hi Joe and Chris, getting it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> to reiterate from my previous email, do you want to explain that? Because he put my name first. Yeah. Whereas previously he put Chris and Joe. Did he? I think that's. Yeah, that's, that's the, the gag. People often put Chris and Joe. Yeah, correctly. No. Well, the last time he said hi all. So. Hi all. <laughs> uh, hi Joe and Chris. Like, <laughs> to reiterate from my previous email, yes, I have watched Cell Block 99. I was referring to IMDb categorizing it as a crime drama. Okay. As most of the films you, got, you guys review are horror. Mm. So I thought it might be exempt from your review. You're right. Let's just never air this. <laughs> However, it is brutal with horrific scenes. True. Correct. Hope you enjoy it. However, it should have been called anything other than Brawl on Cell Block 99, mm. as Joe Public will be waiting for a 300-style punch-up at the yeah. end, which is not the case. Yeah. I think that's probably, like, the guy on my Facebook was probably, like, he wanted a... He wanted a the raid. That's what it makes me think of, is, it, is it, the raid. Have you seen, like, we saw the raid too, yeah. in which there is a brawl in a prison, yeah. and that is a brawl. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. capital B. <laughs> Like in a mud pit, yeah. basically. I would. I was hoping for like a classic Western bar, like people breaking chairs over each other's heads, yeah, yeah. punching each other in the faces of bottles. You know, like tables go flying. Sure. A horse runs through the bar. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. A real, a real brawl. Yeah. A real fucking standoff. <laughs> fucking what? What does he say? I came here for a, a shootout. Shootout. Stuart finishes up like by saying, Western. Stuart finishes up by saying, anyway, thanks for the best movie podcast I listen to, including Kermode and Mayo. Well, you heard it here first. Stuart, what's his name? Stuart Baxter. Stuart Baxter. Stuart Baxter has leapt to the top of our favorite uh, listeners. Yeah. Can you beat him next week, listener? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Email in howtosurviveshow at gmail.com with your praise and your suggestions <laughs> for movies we can cover in the, uh, the coming weeks. Yeah, it's nice to do uh, listener suggestions because you get a bit of feedback and it's... Um, a bit of variety as well. Yeah. 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 Normally we get locked into a pattern of doing films we want to watch. Well, yeah, we get locked <laughs> into a pattern of doing um, 
sequels to franchises over and over again uh, as they, you know, get increasingly annoying and yeah. frustrating. What film are we doing next week, Joe? Uh, well, it's keeping the franchise theme alive. Uh, the third in the current How to Survive franchise tracker. Yeah. Paranormal Activity 3. Mm. So it's been 10 weeks since Paranormal Activity 2. Um, we haven't learned anything, apparently, in those interim weeks about decision making. So, yeah, Paranormal, forward to that. Paranormal Activity 3 next week. Yeah. If you've got any thoughts how you'd survive Paranormal Activity 3, which is on Netflix in the UK and probably elsewhere, mm-hmm. then do watch it and let us know. Yeah. How to Survive Show at gmail.com or tweet at How to Survive Pod or follow us on Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash How to Survive Pod. Absolutely. Don't forget as well that our Saw Marathon, which we did for Halloween, which is a few weeks back now, but no less relevant to any horror movie or movie review fans. Mm. Uh, our video where we chained ourselves to a wall to watch all the Saw movies back to back is yep. on howtosurviveshow.com. Mm. Got some good. good feedback, didn't we, uh, this week on that um, yeah, do you on that video? Read that out. Uh, one person in particular, actually, on YouTube said, uh, anybody, not- anybody else notice each one of these guys' experiments are right at the gore parts so they don't have to look at it? Yeah. That's, that and then he followed, that, the <laughs> he followed that comment up minutes later with, all, they que- all the questions they had about the films would just be answered if they were just shut up for 30 seconds. Yeah, I bet he's a hoot at parties. So if you want great content, <laughs> yeah. then go to howtosurviveshow.com mm. or find us on YouTube. Yeah, a video, by the way, that YouTube deems to be too shocking. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to promote it, but it was deemed too shocking. Too spooky for you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, check that out. And leave us a review on iTunes if you've enjoyed what you've heard today. Yeah. How to Survive Show at gmail.com is the email address. But if you want to leave a review, that's on iTunes. <laughs> Uh, and uh, now that we've finished all of our um, little plugs <laughs> at the end, mm. uh, it's a very special podcast, this, isn't it? It's a um, very special one for you, Joe. Uh, it's bittersweet in many ways, isn't it? Why is that? Um, because, of course, this is the last uh, the last podcast you will be recording as a single man. Yeah. I um, hadn't worked that out in the calendar in my brain, but you're right, yeah. 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 So, so um, when this goes live... My wedding's in four days. Yeah. Yep. Written your speech. You're 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 a best man. A best man. Yeah. Can three pick of them, one. Three of them. Yeah. Indecisive. Yeah. yeah. Written your speech. How to survive being married to Joe? That's not what the speech is. I guess not. Good. I hope not. Imagine I don't if think, it was. I think my playing future the th- wife's playing grandmother the listens to the podcast. <laughs> playing the theme tune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spoilers <laughs> ahead. Yeah. As, as we recap, <laughs> Joe's, Joe's the life, life so far. <laughs> Maybe if I was the only best man, but yeah. the other best men would just be standing there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'd also have to be uh, take part you, in this. You'd speech. have to write yeah. notes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So h- how would you survive being married to yourself, Joe? Well, firstly, to remember is I'm a, a giving lover. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> You're going to be divorced by the, next, by the time the next one comes out. Uh... Why did you bring that up anyway? I don't know. I thought it was nice. Nice, nice yeah. little nod. Yeah, yeah. Send so you, send your congratulations. Yeah, maybe you should in the form in. of a five star review. <laughs> maybe tell us how to survive being married. How to yeah. su- how to survive show at gmail dot com. Yeah. So congratulations are in order to Joe. Thanks. Uh, next week, in celebration, you're going to be skyping in from your honeymoon to talk about <laughs> Paranormal Activity Three. Yeah. Ah, oh, what a world we live in. <laughs>